so you're more familiar with the new grading scheme that I've done, which is yeah. specification grading, and you can ask me other numbers. Oh, I'm not sorry, did you go to the last semester? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I do not do any performance-based testing anymore. I feel it's not uh, a good way to, uh, to uh, uh, evaluate uh, the learning process uh, of students. On one hand, I think it, the last semester was on one hand a great success because uh, 9 out of 11 students got an A and those 9 students got an A. But had a better A, in my opinion, you learn more than say uh, 4 or 5 days that they had given one year earlier. So I, I felt extremely enthusiastic. The reason for that was also because in specification grading, uh, and I will show you on, on Wednesday, uh, you uh, can clearly see what you need to do in order to get an A, B, C, or D, or fail. You know? You either do it or you don't. So, and, and you, and, 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 and you, so sort of, you, you do a certain number of labs successfully. There's no middle grades, it's either pass or fail. You, you just make it happen. Or if it's a little bit wrong, then it is wrong. It is how industry works, so you make it work. Now, and in that way, uh, I noticed that, uh, pretty, first of all, pretty much all the students want to get an A, of course, but what I had not realized is, is that also my former, say, uh, B-level students, and even, you know, I would say, C-level students, would like to really focus on that A, but if you have a slower learning pace, you need to put in a lot more time. So I got a lot of uh, complaints back on the amount of time that was put into in terms of homework. And, um, and that has cost me my student reviews, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> the individual questions were great, but uh, oh my god, uh, the students uh, killed me off. <laughs> so I, I will have to uh, probably have a talk uh, <laughs> with, uh, you know, as usual, you will get called out uh, yeah. by your boss, and I thought that I've got the thoughts that I'm doing it. But I've covered my. But, um, but, uh, but, but I'm still very enthusiastic. So what I'm going to do in the future is, I'm pretty sure I carry the day is going to be It's going to be You know, we should just start it. And hopefully you will not drop out, of course, out of the course. We'll be doing that. But yeah, one of the plans would be to actually take uh, the microcontroller, the basic microcontroller class uh, people. I, I, I will move out uh, a bunch of material about uh, everything about SPI and I2C, and we'll go to the advanced course. Then I can lengthen the blocks with one more week, the earlier ones that I've been teaching. And that means that also these students feel more comfortable, because why not? It would be fantastic if all of these students actually get in. But like the, 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 because they will really learn something. It would be fantastic. And those who really want to learn a lot more, they can always look, uh, they, they can do additional assignments. But let's start with this course though. So um, so this one would you like to start? Yeah. It is already started. What? Already started. You already started? Yeah. Alright. Well we would probably you probably I'll cut it. Okay. Alright, so um, okay, so I will first give a little bit of an intro uh, to pointers and structs. And then uh, what I would like to do is um, quickly go over uh, some of the SPI uh, communication that you need to use because you are going to a CAN laboratory and a CAN laboratory actually requires you to communicate uh, through SPI with the uh, controller. And that will become much more clear later on. So in the end what you will need to do is you will need to use a library for SPI. You have done that before already. previous course, but um, we'll go over that again. But now let's talk about uh, pointers. So uh, let's just look at this little bit of code, because I think that's uh, really the easiest to think uh, about pointers. So first of all, if you think about a value, it's stored at some address right, in storage, whatever the storage is. So, you know, it could be here, it could be something else, that's right. Now, that particular address contains uh, some value. Now, we see here two uh, uh, 
you know, declarations. One says, well, I want to declare a variable var as an integer, and in this line, at the same time, we give it also an initial value. You can see you can do that. So you do the first declaration, and then you actually initialize it to the value 1. So this variable, you don't see it, you do not know, but abstractly, this name var is now representing this value 1. But it must be stored somewhere. There must be an address associated to that. And the address associated to that, you can find out by adding this, uh, you know, this, uh, how can you call it? Like, like this N symbol. Ampersand. Why do you Ampersand. Ampersand. Ampersand? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, you <laughs> so you put it right before the variable, and that will be the address. Now, this particular line tells you that I would like to um, declare the variable that I call, call ADR of address. But I declare a pointer to an integer. So what is a pointer to an integer? It's a, 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 to an integer value. It's actually a pointer. It, it actually represents an address where an integer is stored. So if you look at these three lines, and now we do the following print statements, well, if you want to know the address of where this variable is being stored, I can look, uh, I, I, I can actually use this uh, impotent uh, symbol before the far, and that will tell me, for example, this address over here, so some kind of address. And if I do the address stored in address, which is just a variable now, it's a variable, it does not have this ampersand uh, in front of it, it's just a variable, and that variable was declared, what was, was initialized by the address of where this variable was stored. So it will have the same, exact same value. Now, if I'm going to uh, look at the value of what address is pointing at, right, then I need to look and then, then, then I will write it out like this. I have this uh, star symbol in front of address. And that means that the address is being looked up in memory. Then you will have a look at what value is stored there, and that is being returned. Well, what is stored at this address? Well, it is the actual value 1. So that is what we do with pointers. So that's the pointer structure. Now, if we have an array, for example, then, uh, an, um, then an array uh, itself, like say an array that is called uh, A, I uh, should have brought some uh, markers, but I didn't. Um, so if an array A, and um, say it has 100 elements, so declared as 100 elements, then A, just using the word A itself, is an address actually. In an address, if I look at the zeroth position, then I'm interested in the value of what is stored in that address. If I look at A and then 1, for example, then I'm interested in the value that is stored at not the address, but the next address, address plus 1, if you will, and so on. So this is, so, so that kind of stuff you will not really see, but, but, but the arrays are also defined in terms of pointer structures in a sense. And uh, so, Let's have a look at this uh, piece of uh, code over here. So, uh, you may want to uh, modify the content of some address, right? So, say here we have uh, two declarations, both n and x are integer uh, values that are declared, initialized to, one, to 10 for n. And here again I have a pointer, which is simply again, you know, uh, uh, with a star, it means I'm declaring pointer as being an address. That if I'm going to uh, look at the value at that address, it should return an integer. So now say I again uh, declare uh, or, or I initialize pointer to be, uh, you know, uh, the address of this integer n. And then I can also assign to x, because it's an integer, the value that I see at the address of pointer by using this star. So what do we do here? We effectively know that if a certain address contains an integer, I can also access that value through the pointer. 
and I can use that in all kinds of uh, instructions. So I can just actually have another y that can also make equal to that value that the point three says or this, 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 this point is. Now this is really all that you need to know uh, right now. But um, what the plan is, is that uh, um, actually I'm thinking about using this and actually the Wednesday lecture to go more through the Ken uh, lab itself and it will also show you, uh, but that's not in the, the directories, but, but I'd like to show you some of the C coding solutions that we have where we use these types of structures so that you can see how that works and then you can also understand how, like, say, you write a library, for example, how do you, what, 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 what would you put in a .h file, what do you put in a .c file, right, and so forth. But we'll take it step by step. Now, there will be a first lab that is not at all part of, of any uh, grading or what, but it is uh, uh, a very first uh, setup lab with a bunch of test codes that you want to run just to see if everything works for you. But there's one little uh, assignment that talks about pointers and structs for you if you like to, to experiment with. But once all your material is in good shape, then of course you would like to go ahead with the camera right away. Now let's talk about structures. Yes. So I noticed in the other slide that the address was 32 bits. So is it typically 32 bits? Uh, it, it depends or, on uh, where you run this at. Okay. So if you run it on your laptop, I'd say yes. But if you're running it on an MCU, then obviously we have a much smaller amount. So you don't even know exactly how much it is. Uh, yeah. It is much smaller. And then I was going to ask how the address, like how you know where it starts. Or so we use the return to start. Yeah, you could use the star, a star. Uh, so, so what well, no, no, like say you do like int, like int n equals 10. Mm -hmm. And if you there is, how do you know what the address is like in uh -huh. a start? Like, why is it starting at that value of the operating system? Oh, that is what just the compiler and the operating system are okay. doing. Just that extra value yeah. address. Right, right, right. Uh, so uh, that's the beautiful thing about uh, operating systems. Because operating systems uh, do all the resource scheduling. So they right. do the scheduling of all your memory, they do the scheduling of all your uh, computing resources. So if you have multiple threads running, like on your laptop, you have you know, your interface of different programs running, and the, the human is kind of slow, so you don't really see that it's really a sequential way of executing everything. But the operating system is in charge. And that's, at the end of this particular course, we also have a uh, real-time operating system laboratory. Mm -hmm. And real-time operating systems will obviously play a role in, 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 in the robots or, or as you don't, have, you don't have to use it for a final project, but, but it's good to know about it because for uh, general control systems and so forth, you would like to have a real-time operating system. So we talk about free RTOS and we would like to yeah, I was going to ask, uh, so instead of storing a number at a variable, would you then store it at a specified address? Would you like pick the address uh, you want to store it at? You could uh, do that too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can uh, just, uh, like, like for example, this pointer mm -hmm. is uh, initialized with the value of this address, but I could create my own address, but I have to be careful, of course, I need to know whether that address is not being used by something else. Right. That's the reason why you see you would like to uh, not directly allocate addresses or ranges of addresses, but uh, you may want to tell the operating system that you want to allocate a, say, consecutive range of addresses for a certain uh, data structure. So. And uh, we'll come to that also, probably uh, on Wednesday, when we talk more about the CAN laboratory itself. Because you can then do uh, what we do, a memory allocation to a variable that expresses that you would like to reserve a bunch of addresses. You don't care where it starts, but you care usually about the fact that there are next to one. So, yeah, but so structures are really great uh, to use. So what we will be doing, uh, uh, you can choose your own solutions, right? But what 
we have been doing in our own solution for this CAM laboratory is that we create a structure of a message. And a message will have, say, some data. It will have a message identifier. It will have maybe other components that all together will uh, allow you to, uh, uh, you know, you do not want to create separate variables for each message um, because that will be really cumbersome to understand, to read your own code with imagine. So why not create a type, like an integer type? Are you ready? I can see it. And uh, so an integer type, the, 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 uh, or, or like an integer type, some other kinds of type, like that we call books, so we create a structure that is called books, and we say, well, if you declare a variable book, right, according to this type, then we know that book has a field called title, author, and illustrator. So I will give you an example when we get to that uh, for the message uh, that we're going to transmit between uh, all of the CAN uh, communication channel. But the point is that uh, you can access this title by uh, by a few way by a few ways. You can do book dot title, and then you get the title out of that uh, variable book or you can uh, put an arrow title and then you also get the title and so forth. So this structure is, is, is really nice to use um, uh, to make your uh, uh, code readable and easily manipulatable. Take for example, uh, you will be uh, creating uh, procedures for transmitting a message. It's much nicer to have a procedure that takes one argument, which is the message, rather than uh, message identifier data and so forth. You have no clue anymore what all belongs to the message. And finally, you also have another field in, that says address, for example. But that address was not part of the message, but how do you know as a reader what is part of what? So this struct allows you to modularize units of information. And I think that's very important. So uh, I hope you will adopt to that. All right, so uh, we will do the actual intro of this class uh, later, because we have the lab, you know, uh, after this. And um, so we'll skip this particular slide for now, because I want to go over the uh, very quickly go over this. Um, oh, actually, I forgot to bring a pointer, but. Uh, you have already studied SPI, and you will need SPI to communicate with the CAN controller. So, just I want to remind you that we have a clock signal uh, that you need to uh, set between master and slave. You have a master output uh, slave in, master input slave out, and you have a select channel, like which, which device we actually select. Now, in our case, you will have the MCU, and next to it you have the CAM controller, so you know there's just one select, of course, that you will do, but those four channels are, 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 are connecting the two devices. So that's what we will see when uh, we look at uh, the layout of what you need to put together in the hardware. So there's a bunch of uh, SDI data modes and so forth, I'm not going to go into detail with this because this is all hidden in the SPI code that you have already written. You can look that up in your own, in, in, in your own files. So I do like to quickly go over this code because effectively what you're going to start out with in the CAN laboratory is to write an SPI library. Now you probably will copy over the SPI library that you had before, but um, we have changed a tiny bit because that's what we did. You may not choose to do so, but, but the point is that uh, if you come to make some changes, then uh, you need to have these components part of it. So for example, you need to initialize the SPI, right? So you will want to write an initialized um, SPI functionality that is going to uh, set all these channels. And obviously, you would like to use names that make sense. And those names are uh, depending on which ports and which pins you're going to use for those uh, channels, right? For those four wires. And that you will have defined separately. 
uh, in, uh, in as, as a definition, right? So uh, define, for example, dd underscore ss is equal to uh, uh, some pv something, uh, whatever you choose. Now, so you will set this up. You will also do all of this stuff. And, you pro and, 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 and what would be probably a good thing to do is that you want to uh, uh, create, um, uh, you would also want to initialize uh, the pins, the right pins as output and the right pins as input, so that you make sure that it's all initialized in one go. So that we did not do in the code that you have from the basic course, right? But it would be good to add it in. But effectively the code is exactly the same. You do uh, a transmission, for example, then you uh, do exactly what we have done here. You do those, and and and, and, and that's it. So uh, yeah, so 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 that's what you would like to. So look that up again. But that is what we will use in order to communicate the can control. And here we have the slave. It's pretty much the same type of code in a sense. Um, again, you want to. Uh, uh, initialize uh, 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 a bunch of stuff, and then you have the slave receive, where you simply wait till um, uh, you know you can read uh, this particular um, register. So that's it. So that's what this was about. But we have to look back into it again, and uh, I'd like to stress that now that you're going to work with this again, don't forget uh, the traps that you may have fallen in before which is that if you program in ISP mode, right, you will need to restart Admin Studio every time you program this process, this MCU. So, better is to use debug wire, and then of course, remember, the debug wire interface requires this fuse to be enabled, but if you do so, you will have to, uh, 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 you know, uh, before you go on, you know, you need, you and you need to, uh, so, so where was this? But um, uh, yeah, you will need to enable the DUN fuse, and after that, you need to actually disable it. So make sure that if, if you want to pro if you want to program uh, your MCU again with, with other stuff you need. So, so remember to read this again. Uh, so that I want to quickly go over. Um, look at this slide deck again. It's always good to look at what kind of uh, debugging you can do because you will use that. And uh, we can recap that at some point as well. So now I would like to go to the CAN laboratory. Um, and I would first need to explain to you a little bit about the CAN itself, obviously. So, all right. So, first of all, um, take for example a car, and you will notice, I don't know if it's the sharp here, yeah, the sharp, you will notice that uh, there are two types of uh, communication protocols, CAN and LIN. LIN is a, sim is a simplified version of CAN, and it's a very cheap communication mechanism, and you will find it in all kinds of, uh, uh, especially in a car, in all kinds of, of, of uh, systems. And um, what does it do? Well, CAN is based on message-oriented broadcasting, and uh, you'll actually, uh, what you'll see is you will have uh, two wires of communication that help, uh, that, that are designed in such a way that you can uh, uh, reduce internal noise uh, a lot. Messages are identified by a message identifier, which is great. And, uh, you know, the message identifier defines not only the content, but also the priority. The lower the message identifier, like the closer it is to zero, uh, that means that that message will have the highest priority because I will explain in a moment how arbitration happens. How do you know which 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 peripheral needs to pick up on that uh, message, or which message is, is going to be uh, transmitted at that particular moment in time? Uh, well, it's the one with the lowest address, and that was the highest priority. Now, it's great for uh, uh, for 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 short range communication and so forth. So this is very quickly, but uh, let me explain uh, a little bit more about uh, the two frame formats. Uh, you have a standard one and an extended one, and it's simply the number of bits that are used to identify a message. 
there are a bunch of frame types, like a data frame, um, so it's an error frame, overflow, overflow, remote frame. But um, what's the structure? 